play of mercy. Don't take it for granted. It ain't, it ain't like it's everywhere. No, he sure doesn't. Praise the Lord for it. Acts chapter 23 tonight. I want to put, give you what the Lord's put on my heart for this evening. Acts chapter 23, and we'll read the first 11 verses of the chapter. Now, I've got two other portions of Scripture that we're going to stop at along the course of the message to highlight the truth that I'm giving you tonight. Uh, the truth that I'm giving you is found in three different places in the life of the Apostle Paul. And so I'm going to highlight all three of them this evening, and I trust it will be a help and a blessing to you uh, in your daily walk with the Lord. Acts chapter 23, verse number 1, the Bible said, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And that's, that's all he got out of his mouth before they decided they wanted to smack him real good. Verse 2 and the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. He didn't get much out before they got ticked off real good. Verse 3, Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it's written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Verse 9, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them, and to bring him into the castle. Now watch verse number 11 with me very carefully. We're going to find something that's mentioned in three different instances in the life of Paul. Verse 11. And the night following, watch what it said, the Lord stood by him. I want you to notice that little phrase there. The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, here's a man on the page of the Scripture in front of you that's familiar to all of us. He writes the majority of the New Testament. Uh, at least he writes uh, the, the most books of one individual in the New Testament. And here we find at this point in his life, everything's against him. And not only is everything against him, everyone is against him. Uh, I mean, here in our text, Paul is... He's all alone. The only person that is even remotely close to him at this point is Luke, the one who is pinning this account down. But even Luke can't be right there with him, standing next to him through this. This is stuff that he's had to have rehearsed in his ears from the mouth of the Apostle Paul and from different eyewitness accounts tonight. And here's a man that everything and everyone's against him. They're trying to kill him. If you was to go back to chapter 21 and 22 and then read on later in chapter 23, they got conspiracies out to kill this old boy. I mean, look at here. Most of us feel like everything's against us and everyone's against us when just a few little things go wrong in our life. I mean, but really, really, what if you was all alone and I mean hundreds of people hated your ever-loving guts to the point to where when you stood up, they wanted to slap you in the mouth as soon as you started talking and then was trying their hardest to get you executed by the powers that be in that day. I mean, everything really is against this guy. Everyone really is against 
this guy. The brethren are not here at this point. All them churches that Paul started, they're not here at this point. They're not there to cheer him up. They're not there to pat him on the back. All them people, countless thousands of people that Paul has led to the Lord, been a spiritual father to, none of them are here. And everybody that Paul has helped, nobody's there to help him. Nobody's there to say, God bless you. It'll be all right. Trust in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord. I mean, nobody's there to help him. He's all alone. But can I say we find Paul has one ace in the hole. You say, what is Paul's one ace in the hole? Even though everything and everyone's against him and nobody's there to help him, the Bible said in verse number 11 that the night following in verse 11, the Lord stood by him tonight. In spite of everything and everyone being against him, there was somebody that was for him tonight. There was somebody that was standing with him and standing on his behalf this evening. You say, who's that? It's the Lord. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder Paul could pin such a thing as he did in Romans chapter 8 verse number 31. If God be for us, who can be against us tonight? And child of God, I want to try and encourage your heart tonight that regardless of your opposition in your life and regardless of the obstacles that you face in your life, You can count on this if you're a child of God washed in the blood and trying to walk in the Spirit and walk by the Word and the will of God. There is a Savior who will stand with you tonight. There is a Savior that will stand for you tonight. Now we're going to find in Paul's life there are three times where the Bible says the Lord stood with him. The Lord stood by him. The Lord stood with him. We're going to find three times where the Lord stands with Paul tonight. And I want to preach on this thought in your hearing for a few minutes. I'm preaching on when everything stands against you, Jesus will stand with you. When everything stands against you, Jesus will will stand with you. I have no idea what kind of things you got in your life tonight that you feel like are standing right up against you and that are in opposition to you. But I I, I don't really have to know. I don't need to know. I know the one that stands with you tonight as a child of God. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Us. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now let me give you a news update, child of God. You ain't nothing without him. Now I, I know that's not good English. That's terrible English, but it's real good theology tonight. Bad English, but good theology. You ain't nothing without him. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said this. Without me, ye can do nothing tonight. You ain't nothing, and you can't do nothing, and you can't be nothing without the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. I'm talking about doing something, being something for the glory of God tonight. But honey, if God's for you and the Lord stands with you, then it really don't matter who's against you. It really don't matter what they said about you. It really don't matter what problem stands in front of you. If he is on your side tonight, you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I shall not fear what man can do unto me. You can take confidence in the fact that the Lord Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? (laughs) For thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me 
in the presence of mine enemy. My cup runneth over. Thou knowest my head with all. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. You know the story, friend. I'm trying to tell you, if he's for you, you got an ace in the hole. You got a leg up. You got a blessing that the world does not have tonight. You say, preacher, I'm lonely. I'm not saying you're not lonely. What I'm saying is there's somebody there to be with you. You say, preacher, you don't know how many people and how many obstacles are against me. No, I do not. What I'm trying to tell you is I know the God of heaven will stand by your side. You say, how can you say that with such confidence? Well, one, I got the word of God on it. But two, I have experienced what I'm preaching tonight. I ain't preaching to you out of a head full of knowledge. I'm preaching to you out of a heart full of experience this evening. I've been there when I felt like nobody was with me. I've been there when it felt like all my friends had walked off and left me. I've been there when the lights went off and I felt like I was all alone. And I also know what it's like for the sweet abiding presence of the Spirit of God to come by my way. Stand out up next to me and say, Son, I'll never leave thee and I'll never forsake thee. I'm here with you whether anybody else is or not tonight. So I'm preaching on when everything stands against you, Jesus will stand with you. I want to show you three times that Jesus stood with Paul. I'm going to hurry and be done. Let me say number one, Jesus stood with him. Number one, when society was against him. When society was against him. Did you notice in our text here, that, that's what I just read to you. I read to you point number one in these first 11 verses of Acts chapter 23. Did you notice that all of society, Brother Kevin at this point, stands against the Apostle Paul? The, the entire societal world at this time, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Romans, they're all against him. You say, how come they're against him? Because his preaching was unpopular. <laughs> His preaching stood in opposition to Judaism, Romanism, and heathenism tonight. And because his message was one of confrontation, because his message was one of opposition against what they believed, they began to stand against him. Now let me say this to you. Listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. Society is still against the message that the Apostle Paul preached. And if you live, believe, and preach the message the Apostle Paul preached, society will still be against you tonight. I'm I'm weary of any Christian. I'm weary of any church that just gets along in society. I'm weary of any church that can be real high up on the social status and the social order and they can get along, brother, with the moose clubs and the goose clubs and the why and this, that, and the other. You say, why? Because I realize after a little while of preaching that Bible, you're going to run contrary to what the world thinks. You're going to run contrary to the news media. You're going to run contrary to the educational society. You're going to run contrary to the entertainment world. You're going to run contrary to the mainstream stream religious movement if you stand with the book this evening. Society was against him. Can I just give you all a news update whether you know this or not? I don't mean to be doom and gloom here tonight even though that is kind of my nature that you know that by now. Uh, society's against y'all. Talking about if you're living for God and living by the Bible, I'm not talking about just being a contemporary Christian. I'll, I'll tell you another reason why I hate that word contemporary. Have you ever looked the word contemporary up? The word contemporary means of the times. Getting along in the times being of the times. The Christian was never called to be of the time they were living in. They were called to be of the Bible. And if what they live is against the times, then jump the times and stay with the book this evening. Listen, brother, if you're going to live for God, you can mark this down. Society will stand against you. The mainstream media will contradict what you and I believe and what we preach. Christian, Christian, stop sucking up everything that comes straight out of the mainstream media's toilet receptacle and eating it up like it's the gospel truth. 
think for yourself and read your Bible this evening, y'all. Listen to me. That mainstream media, it's against God. It's against our Bible. It's against what we preach. Brother, you ain't, I, I, I have, I've divorced myself. Look here. Since the last election, I done had it all I could handle, Brother Keith, Brother Ken. I done had all I could handle. I done divorced myself. I have. My, 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 what I used to look at on my phone was called the Gateway Pundit. It was a conservative news site. And you know, if you look at a certain website long enough, it'll like add itself to your favorites when you first click on. It's been so long since I looked at it. I went to looking for it the other day and it wasn't even on my favorites no more. I only, I just, I've divorced myself. I try, I try and live in my world and act like that fool ain't even in the White House up there, that nursing home patient that don't belong there. I'm, I'm trying to live my life divorced from it. You say why? Because everything they teach, believe, and preach is against what I'm teaching my family and what I'm trying to live in my life. I am not trying to get along with LGBTQ and whatever else they got going on. I am not trying to buy into partial birth, full term, or nothing else abortion in my life. I'm not trying to get along with Black Lives Matter and Antifa and the whole rest of the bunch of communist garbage that's being shoved and ramrodded down our throats. I ain't trying to get along with it. It's against the Bible. It's against my God. And I'm happy to be away from it this evening. Entertainment. The enter I'm getting somewhere. The entertainment world stands against you tonight. Mom and Daddy, listen to me. If you think them bunch of godless reprobates in Hollywood or them bunch of filthy, godless, ungodly reprobates that sing pop and rock and hip-hop and rap got your best interest at heart, you got another thing coming. Let me pause right here. Let me pause right here and give you this. Y'all remember here just a little while back, a few weeks ago, all that, that tennis shoe come out, that, that little Nas made, you know, and all that stuff, and, and, and the tennis shoe was the truth. The only thing that was a little bit skewed is Nike did not give him the approval to do it. He did it on his own, but the shoe was the truth. Anyways, he's the one that sung that Old Town Road song and all this kind of thing. I got a picture that I still got on my phone somebody sent me. It was a response from Lil Nas to a concerned parent on Twitter. Lil Nas got more sense than some Christian parents I know this evening. That There was a concerned parent that said this. They said, Lil Nas, don't you know my child loved to hear you sing Old Town Road and now you've come out with this satanic stuff and it's bothered me and blah, blah, blah. And this was his response. This was his response, Brother John. He said, ma'am, Old Town Road, in Old Town Road, I promoted adultery, fornication, and drinking. In Old Town Road, he said, you should be screaming what your children are listening to. <laughs> Little Nas said that. I said, my God, the godless homosexual reprobate has more sense than mama's and daddy's God. Stop feeding your kids to the entertainment world. They're against your values. They are trying to deprogram and reprogram the minds of your youngins. They're against it. I'm telling you, brother, the mainstream media is against it. The religious world we see now is against us. I ain't trying to preach no persecution complex. I don't have to. I got somewhere I'm going here in just a minute that I don't have a persecution complex about it. I, I like being the underdog. I think some people, it bothers some people to like be, well, they're all against me. It don't bother me none. It just makes me bear down even harder. Yeah, amen, amen. We go out there street preaching, we go out there street preaching, and I'll be honest with you, Brother Roger, I feel uncomfortable when we don't get about half a dozen bird flip-offs and about half a dozen people cuss us out. That, that kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. I feel like if we out there and we preach in the book and preaching Jesus, there ought to be some opposition from the devil's crowd out there. We don't get it. I start feeling uncomfortable about the thing, man. Amen, amen. If I can preach for about a month and nobody gets a little bit rankled and ticked off, I feel like I ain't even done my job in the pulpit. Somebody say amen right there. Opposition ain't never bothered me. Opposition don't bother me. It makes me want to bear down harder this evening. Look here, I'm telling you, we're living in a day where the religious world, the mainstream media, the entertainment world, they're against us. You say, does that bother you? No, because I couldn't care less what they think. There is one that sits on the throne tonight, and he's for me, and he's on my side, and I'm on his side tonight. And it doesn't matter if the whole world goes this way, if my Lord's over there, I'll I'll go with him and he'll stand with me and that's just fine tonight. 
That's just fine. I, I, I absolutely love, y'all know I love history, and I've quoted this to you before, but it bears repeating because I love the last line of the letter. One of my favorite stories of history, what got me involved in history, was the Battle of the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas. They just celebrated almost 200 years of Texian independence out there. Uh, March 6, 1836, the fall of the Alamo. And during the time of that big old siege, them 180 some odd Texian defenders gathered into that little crumbling adobe mission uh, down there outside of the town of San Antonio de Bihar. And, and thousands of Mexicans under General Santa Ana uh, surrounded them. I mean, had them surrounded on every side. They was outnumbered. I mean, 10 to 1, brother. They was all against them. They was all alone. And old William Barrett Travis wrote that great immortal letter that I've read and seen many times before and he addressed it this way. He said to the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. He said I shall never surrender or retreat. He said the enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. He said I've answered the demand with a cannon shot and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. He said, I call on you in the name of liberty and patriotism and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. He said, the enemy are receiving reinforcements daily and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. He said, if this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. And he signed in all capital letters and underlined it, victory or death. And this is the part I wanted to get to. He wrote a PS, a postscript. You can look at it, man, on photocopies. His PS said this, PS, the Lord is on our side. I say amen right there. Brother, you may feel outnumbered now, government. You mark this down. If you're living for God and serving the Lord, he's on your side regardless if all society stands against you tonight, friend. You let it bother you that society stands against you. Jesus is standing for you. Amen. Paul, Paul had the Lord stood for him when society was against him. Can I show you another one? Chapter 27. Not only when society was against him, but secondly, when a storm was against him. The Lord stood with him. Jesus stood with him. Not only when society was against him, but when a storm was against him. Watch chapter 27. And verse number 18, y'all know this story. It's that great story of the Eurocladon. This, this, this big old storm that pops up with Paul out in the Mediterranean and, and almost kills all of them. Chapter 27, verse 18. Verse 18 said, And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Now watch it. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. I mean, brother, here they are in the middle of the storm. They end up staying in it for about two weeks plus. And they get finally to a place where Luke is writing this down. Luke's in the storm with Paul. And he said, all hope's gone. I mean, I just ain't got no hope whatsoever that we're going to survive or make it out of this storm. Look here. You ever take hope away from an individual? You've took away everything they got. I'll never forget reading a story one time about a fellow named Mayor Hirsch. Mayor Hirsch uh, was a little Jew boy uh, over in the, Europe when the Nazis took over over there. And they herded Mayor Hirsch and his entire family into little cattle cars, shoved them in them things so tight, and, and drove them miles and miles, and finally got out at, I believe it was Auschwitz, and uh, one of them death camps. Brother Mark, they said when Mayor Hirsch got out of that thing, they took his mom and daddy that way and took his siblings the other way, and he never saw them again. Mary Hurst was just a little fella, 10, 12, 11, 13 years old, somewhere along in there. And old Mayor Hurst, he ended up surviving. They had pictures of him. By the time that the Allies rescued him, he looked like just an emaciated skeleton. I mean, they, you know, he just, just skin and bones. If you ever seen them pictures of those Holocaust survivors when they were liberated, man. And he, I mean, just wasn't nothing to him. And years later, when he was an old man, somebody come by and they did an interview and they asked him, how did you survive? How did you make it? through all of that. And this is what Mayor Hurst told him. He said, sir, he said, I found this out. He said, I found out a person can go days and days and days without food. I've done it. 
He said, I found out a person can go weeks without interaction with anybody else in solitary confinement. I know because I've done it. He said, a person can go a few days without even drinking anything to the point of total dehydration and death. He said, I know because I've done it. But he said this. He said, but a person cannot go more than one moment or two without hope. He said hope is what will get a person through. Hey, you can't go very far without some hope this evening. Here in the text, we find all hope's gone. But brother, by the time we get to the end of the text, hope's going to be reinserted. What reinserts hope in a story where hope had been snatched away in this storm? i tell you what happened. Paul realized somebody was with him. Even in the middle of a storm. Watch your book. Verse 21. Verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. Paul just couldn't, couldn't let well enough alone. He had to give a little I told you so in there. And to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you, be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Watch it. Verse 23. Here's the second time. Watch it. For there stood by me this night... The angel of God. You say, preacher, that's just an angel. No, keep reading who it is. The angel of God whose I am. He didn't belong to no angel. He belonged to Jesus. And whom I serve. He didn't serve an angel. He served Jesus. Let me pause right here and give you a little Bible study here for just a minute. Let me pause and just give you a little Bible lesson. When you read about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that is Jesus Christ of the New Testament. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ. I can prove it to you over and over, but I ain't got time tonight. You study that thing out for yourself, and you'll come believing that's the truth. Here Paul said, the angel of God stood by me. I'm his, and I serve him tonight. You know what took this story and turned it around? It was the fact that Paul realized somebody's standing with me in this storm. I'm telling you, the boat's rocking, the boat's reeling, but there is somebody on board the ship. Hey, Paul already heard the sto- Paul already heard the stories about Jesus in storms before. Paul had already been told by Peter about one night out in a storm how Jesus come walking on the water and said, "Peace be still." Paul had already been told by Peter about a time when their ship was full of water yet it didn't sink because Jesus was in the back of the boat sleeping. You want to know what helped Paul out? He realized, "Good God Almighty, if the God that was in the boat with Peter and the God that was in the boat with James and John back over yonder is the God that's in the boat with me then I reckon I'm going to make it to the other side and child of God you can count on this I have no idea the level and the length and the depth of the storm you're in but if Jesus is in the boat with you you can ride the storm out to the other side you can make it this evening yeah. I'm a pilgrim on Life's weary road There's been many times I've told Neath the heavy load When the way is dark And I cannot see well, I know my Lord Is going to stand by me <laughs> There are burdens great that I must bear. There's some loads of grief for my soul to share. And when the friends I love shall forsake and flee, well, I know my Lord, He's going to stand by me. He's going to stand by me. He's going to stand by me. Well, I know my Lord. He's going to stand by me. When the way gets dark and I cannot see. Well, I know my Lord. He's going to stand by me. You can take that to the bank, y'all. I'm talking about there's a God that'll stand with you tonight when everything stands against you. Yeah, no, and I like, I like it that knowing that Jesus was standing with him in the storm, look what it gave him. Look what it gave Paul because he knew Jesus was standing with him. Watch what it said. Verse 24. 
This is what Jesus told him. He said, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Knowing Jesus was in the boat gave him cheer. Turn your frown upside down, honey. Put on a happy face. If Jesus is in the boat, you can have cheer in the middle of a catastrophe. It didn't just give him cheer. It gave him confidence. Look at the next part that he said. Be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. You know what else to give him right in the middle of that big old storm? Give him some confidence. He said, if God said it, I believe it. That, that Man, that's it. Hey, I believe him. God said we're going to make the other side. I don't know how. I don't know what he's going to do. You know what I like about the fact when the Lord starts standing with you? Y'all don't miss this. When the Lord starts standing with you, he starts giving you favor with the people and in the circumstances that are trying to do you in. Say, so what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, I'm not going back to Acts 23. You go back and read Acts 23. You know what you find in Acts 23? Them Roman soldiers, they got no use for Paul. They're just trying to do him in too. But you know what happens? Right after the Bible said, right after the Bible said in verse 11 that the Lord stood with him, right after that it said that the Jews took an a oath that none of them would eat or drink anything till they killed Paul. And you know what the Bible said? Brother Joe, the Bible said... There was Paul's nephew, his sister's son, overheard him say that. And when he overheard it, he took off running to the chief captain named Lysias and ran to Lysias, the Roman captain, and said, Hey, they're going to kill Paul. They're going to ask you to bring him out to you. And when, they, when you bring him out, they're going to jump him. They're going to kill him. And old Lysias saved his life. Man, you know, what that, you know what that shows me? When the Lord starts standing by you, he'll start setting pieces of the puzzle in the place to, to help you and not do you in. And here in the text, I find in the text, the Bible said the soldiers or the shipmen were about to jump out the ship and leave the ship behind. And they didn't because God was with Paul. And then it said the soldiers was going to kill all the prisoners so they couldn't get loose. And the centurion said, no, I don't want to do that because I believe in that guy enough. I believe in Paul enough. I don't want him to kill him. Brother, you, you start walking with God and God starts standing with you. God will start working things out around you to keep you in his favor and in his will tonight. I've seen that over and over and over this evening. All right, I'm done. Whenever things against you, Jesus will stand with you. He stood with Paul when society was against him. He stood with Paul when a storm was against him. And then lastly, turn to 2 Timothy with me. 2 Timothy in chapter 4, he stood with Paul when seclusion was against him. Seclusion. Here we find Paul's all alone. And even though he's all alone, the Lord's going to stand with him. I've seen something in this today I've never seen before studying this text. And man, this, this was a blessing to me. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul's down to the end. This is going to be the last few verses that Paul's going to write. After this, Paul's going to have his head cut off on Nero's chopping block. He writes nothing more after this. 2 Timothy chapter 4, as far as chronologically, I realize the book of Titus and Philemon and Hebrews, but I mean chronologically, this is the last of the line. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 16. Watch what it said in verse 16 of chapter 4. He tells Timothy this, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. I never really understood that. I got to studying that thing today and reading behind some people of what was, what is this, this first answer he's talking about. And literally in the text, what he's talking about is the first time he stood before Nero, who was a Caesar. Remember the Bible said in Acts, he appealed unto Caesar. Well, he finally gets his audience, Brother Carl, with Caesar, whose name was Nero. And y'all, you'll read about Nero in history. Nero was a maniac. Nero hated God's people so bad, he, he put them in the Colosseums with lions, and watched them get torn apart. Nero was such a depraved, godless individual that he would have these, these uh, parties that I can't even be mentioned, both things he'd do, and he would take Christians and impale their bodies up with big spikes and dip them in tar and light them on fire in the gardens to light up his parties. While they would be having these, these filthy parties, drinking and all kind of stuff in these gardens, 
gardens, the bodies of the Christians were the torches that lit the parties up as they roasted to death. That, that's this maniac that Paul stands before. And this is what he's talking about at my first answer. The first time that he had a chance to answer for himself. He's answering in his own defense. It's like a courtroom setting. It's like a court setting. He's standing before Nero. He has appealed to the highest court of the land. Now he stands before this godless, depraved, reprobate maniac. And he's going to answer for himself. And when he stands before Nero... Brother Noah, surely it would have been a blessing for some Christian brother to stand with him at the trial and say, hey, I'm with that guy. But brother, to stand with Paul in this day means you're going to get whatever punishment he gets. So you really find out who your friends are when the chips are down. I mean, you really find out who's really in it for the long haul when when standing with you means they're going to get punished for it. And here Paul says, at my first answer, when I stood before Nero the first time, nobody stood with me. Everybody forsook me. I stood there all alone as my own defense attorney. But watch what your Bible said. Verse number 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Why? That by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. Say, what in the world does that mean? It means just what it did when he stood before Agrippa. Y'all remember what happened when he stood before Agrippa and Felix? He stood there in that trial. You know what he did? He preached Jesus to them. Can y'all imagine what this looked like? Here comes Paul. They bring him out just like they did over in Acts 26. He got handcuffs on his wrists and shackles on his feet. He'd been in the prison down there and dirty. And he comes waddling out. And they stand him up there before Caesar. I mean Caesar. Nero and his big entourage and all them Gentiles are standing there. And old Nero says, uh, what you got to say for yourself, sir? And he said, well, this is what I got to say for myself. And about that time, I imagine when Paul first walked out there, he thought, man, this is kind of lonely. There ain't nobody here with me. And they're all against me. I'm all by myself. But about that time, Paul felt a little, I'm with you, Paul. Go on ahead and tell them, Paul. Go on, go on ahead and tell them how you met me. Go on ahead and tell them how I changed you. Tell them, Paul. Son Paul felt the boldness of God because he felt the presence of the Lord. He said, you know, I'll just tell you like this, Nero. I used to kill people like myself. I used to hate people like myself. I used to be just like you. But one day riding down Damascus Road, uh, the man named Jesus who died was buried and rose again, showed up in my Damascus Road, knocked me off my high horse, and I got saved down there in the dirt. And from that time till this, I've been telling everybody about somebody who'll save anybody. Nero, I'm telling you, he'll even save you. If you'll call on him and trust him, he'll save anybody in here son he signed his own death warrant but it didn't matter somebody was standing with him tell you what will give you some help when you're all alone you stand here tonight and you say preacher I feel like when I go home I'm all by myself preacher I feel like on my job where I work there ain't no other Christians I'm all alone preacher I feel like when I go see my family they don't know God and they don't know the Lord and I'm all alone I'm telling you this evening, there's somebody named Jesus. He's the one that saved you. And he's the one that stood with Paul. And if he stood with Paul when Paul was all alone, he can stand with you as well this evening. Paul didn't have nobody to go and be his defense attorney. But the Bible said, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Paul had him a defense attorney, but he wasn't down here. He was up yonder standing with Paul. I simply come to tell you tonight, when everything stands against you, Jesus will stand for you. And I don't know what kind of opposition you're facing against you, but it pales in comparison to the individual that is on your side tonight. Don't you walk out here with your head hung low. Don't you walk out here letting the devil beat you up, make you tremble. You walk out of here with the confidence and the fact of the Scripture that Jesus Christ the righteous is on your side tonight. 
Say, preacher, what will society say? Who gives a good flip what society says? He's on my side. You say, my storm's against me. Yeah, but he's bigger than the storm. He's the eye of the storm tonight. He'll stand with you. Let's all pray tonight. Father, thank you so much for the good word of God that encourages us and helps us, strengthens us. God, I, I know, I know beyond shadow of a doubt, there's some people in here tonight that, Lord of mercy, they are facing some real opposition in their life. They're facing some real obstacles in their life. Lord, the, the devil's fighting them. Society's fighting them. Lord, it seems like every which way they're just getting shot at. God, tonight I pray that you would have reminded them. Give their hearts some cheer and confidence knowing that the unseen Lord of heaven is a present help in their trouble. God, I pray tonight we'd walk out of here and go this week telling somebody about Jesus, knowing that you're with us when we do. You told the apostles in Matthew chapter 28, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. God, you'll be with us. You said you would, and we believe that by faith tonight. Help us to understand that. And Lord, say what time I'm afraid I'll trust in thee. Help us, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, bless you people this week. Amen. God bless you, church. I'll see you Thursday night at Open Door Baptist Church. Play for us, sister. You dismiss. God bless you.